Hello, good, uh, good day everybody. Uh, welcome to the EDPN webinar on today, May 10th, 2016. Um, we're talking about diversity of decisions today and adding calls in all situations. And we are collaborating today with Strategic Decisions Group on this webinar. Uh, for today, we'll start with introductions, then actually uh, have the actual webinar and we'll finish up with some closing remarks. Uh, first, I'll start with introducing EDPN. Um, EDPN is the European Decision Professional Networks and provides a platform to, for decision professionals in both business and government that aim to promote high quality decision making in their organizations. EDPN is not for profit and uh, also the first European network with a focus on decision making and the practical applications of decision analysis and decision quality. Um, EDPN is a peer to peer network without a membership. Our network is hosted through face-to-face -face events and webinars like these and the EDPN LinkedIn group. Uh, one of the um, next upcoming face-to-face uh, -face events is the EDPN conference uh, for this year. Uh, it will be hosted in Copenhagen in collaboration with the uh, Copenhagen Business School. And it will be on um, October 4 to 6. And we'll get back to some details about that uh, after the, the webinar. Now let's uh, move to our uh, topic of today, the version of decisions adding quality in all situations. Um, let me start with briefly introducing myself. My name is Ritske, Ritske van der Meer. I'm a secretary with the EDPN, uh, which is a foundation uh, stichting EDPN and uh, a growing professional community in Europe. I am also a, a senior consultant with Strategic Decisions Group, SDG, for about four years now, and I have about uh, eight years of experience in applying decision analysis uh, in technology, oil and gas, and life sciences. Today, I am working together with my colleague, Mark Seidler. Mark is Managing Director of SDG's European Practice and the Global, Global Life Science Practice, and has more than 20 years experience in structuring strategies for global leaders in pharmaceuticals, agrosciences, and fine chemicals in Europe, US, and Asia. Uh, Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you, Riske. I'm glad to be here. Welcome, everybody. Today, we are going to talk about adding quality in each decision situation. After a brief introduction of SDG, we will discuss different types of decisions and how you can add quality in different situations. We have included a brief industry example too, and we will finalize our session today with some closing notes. For those of you who don't know SDG, uh, we are a strategy consulting firm that serves clients in virtually all industry sectors. What is unique about SDG is that we are the, the only major consultancy to focus on improving the quality of decisions. For example, we look at strategies as a series of decisions taken under conditions of uncertainty. It is this intersection of risk, uncertainty, and strategic decisions where SDG is best known. SDG has transformed the manner in which R&D and portfolio investment decisions are evaluated and implemented. We have helped companies create billions in shareholder value. The frameworks developed by SDG for portfolio prioritization are now accepted as the best practice in both the life sciences and oil and gas industries. These are just some examples. You can find out more about the firm or read about our work on our website at scg.com. Uh, our latest publication is our book on decision quality from SCG's CEO, Dr. Carl Spetzler, um, SCG partner, Hannah Winter, and uh, Dr. Je Jennifer Meyer. Uh, we will be discussing decision quality in the next section in more detail. You should also be aware that there are more, uh, that there are other SDG webinars to which you can get access to our website. Amongst the participants. Um, and so what we'd like to know is, um, which industries are represented on the call today. Uh, we're also experimenting here with a, a polling technique 
um, in this um, first EDPN webinar, and uh, we'd like to try it out and see if we can collect this information. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll try this technique again later uh, toward the end of the, of the webinar. Um, so what we'd like you to do is, is tell us about what industry you're in. Um, you can see the list of options here. Um, please use the buttons on the right-hand side of your screen to provide your answers. And I'll hand over to, briefly to Ritzka now as so I'll open up the polling system. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I'm opening up the poll right now. Um, uh, as Mark mentioned, this is our first uh, EDPN webinar uh, in, a, in a series uh, this year. Uh, and it's also the first time that we're actually testing the polling. So uh, let's cross our fingers that this all will come through. I'll, I'll open it for a couple of seconds. Um, let me see. I think everybody actually responded. People still switching choices. And I'll close the poll in five seconds. Okay. Let me see if I can share this. And uh, from my screen, I see that I'm sharing the results of the polling. For those who cannot see it, 60%, um, sixteen percent of you are in pharmaceuticals, uh, twenty percent of you are in oil and gas, and actually, um, not everybody responded. I clicked uh, the, the polling uh, closure too too early, um, uh, so uh, I didn't collect uh, most of the answers. Actually, uh, let me see if I can uh, still open it. We, uh, we also have uh, some people in the chemical industry, high tech as well. Um, so we, we actually have pretty broad representation here. Okay. Very good. Uh, now move on back to you, Mark. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Vizke. Um So uh, let's um, now discuss briefly different types of decisions. Let's get into the material here. Um, let's, let's first define what a decision is. Uh, we're quoting from um, a seminal paper of Professor Ron Howard, um, which you can also find uh, on our website uh, if you want to read more. Um, the quote states, the decision is an irrevocable allocation of resources, irrevocable in the sense that it is impossible to shouldn't cause to change back to the situation that existed before making the decision. So for purposes of this, uh, our purposes, a decision is not a mental commitment to follow a course of action, but rather the actual pursuit of that course of, course of action. Um, now, um, this definition works well in a broad set of contexts. The connection to action and the things we actually do is, is really the important aspect here. Doing decisions in this manner allows us to actually be productive as, as individuals, keeping the action in mind helps us really contribute, whether we're a decision maker ourselves or uh, a decision support staff member or a subject matter expert or somebody has to implement, um, depending on the specific decision situation. The point is we can use this in, in many situations. It's about what we do and, and the actions we take. Um, now, uh, we often talk about strategic decisions. I emphasize that in introducing SDG, but there are other kinds of decisions that are important too in, in creating value. Uh, let's look at an initial classification here of decisions, comparing along uh, the lines of uh, potential cost of failure on the vertical axis and the um, time horizon on the horizontal axis, meaning the time period for considering the impact of the decision and gaining meaningful feedback on the right choices. If we think about what we usually call strategic decisions, as an example in the upper right, um, those can be characterized as decisions uh, with high potential cost of failure, together with long time horizons over which uncertainty about outcomes is resolved. In comparison, you, would have, you could have something that you could call an intuitive decision on the upper left. And what we're trying to define here is uh, situations where uh, the potential cost of failure is still very high, however, the feedback time is far shorter. You see what happens immediately. Um, and 
On the bottom half of the slide, the consequences are less severe with operational and creative decisions. Um, our, our, um, if we go, uh, it's making it hard to make it easier to understand uh, in terms of what we're talking about here. Uh, let's look at some examples. Um, on the upper left, you know, one is uh, disaster recovery or insolvency management. These are uh, things with extremely short feedback loops and, and they require intuitive or internalized procedures to prevent dramatic consequences. Um, examples of creative efforts are, are, are things like, on the bottom right, are things like product ideation, brand strategy, and positioning questions. They also have longer time horizons for feedback. Um, and then, you know, our experience as, as SCG um, in, in our consulting work is, is largely on this, in the areas of creative and strategic decision making. Um, here where the feedback uh, loops are long, here's where the approaches that we use have, have been developed. Um, and I, we've made these distinctions here to talk about the different approaches, the, the, the different kinds of approaches that one can take um, in decision making and defining actions, right, that really depend on the situation. Many of the approaches that are, are listed here will be uh, used by people who are on the phone, particularly uh, the people who are part of the EPDN uh, network as uh, decision professionals. Uh, and I'm not going to read them to you. Um, as mentioned, the, 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 the sort of internalized procedures um, on, the, on the upper left, they, they could actually be written down, uh, uh, are, are for these uh, uh, emergency situations, as I said. The, uh, the lower left corner is, is a typical space uh, where lean, the lean approach is used, a lean decision-making environment. Um, a well-structured approach is needed in strategic decisions and because of the potential cost of failure, as I said before, and there's little chance to get feedback while you're making that decision. And, and, and you're faced with a situation that you would potentially be betting the farm. It, it is worth, in, in this area, having an approach that allows you to think carefully about the direction to take. And for this, we've developed our dialogue decision process, which I'll summarize briefly later. Um, that's our approach to decision quality and strategic decisions. In addition, some decisions, which may be closer to the middle of the diagram due to the shorter feedback loops and smaller value at stake, can still be significant, important. Here we can add quality as well by applying some of the principles we have developed for strategic decisions. We'd like to highlight that approach today. That's where we're going. So let's, let's now talk a little bit about um, the detail on how to add quality in each situation. Um, and I'm going to talk about the elements of decision quality. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about six different requirements here. But before I actually get into that, um, and uh, I'd like to, to just briefly mention here that the key to this concept is that we can actually determine the quality of decisions at the moment you make them, not in hindsight, but beforehand. And for example, if you, uh, to make this more concrete for you, if you go out for some drinks in the evening with friends or colleagues and then drive home afterwards, you may get home safely. Was that a good decision? No, it wasn't. It was a good outcome. Or as Professor Howard puts it, a bad decision never turns good, and a good decision never becomes bad. Getting the decision right requires quality in, 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 in six elements. This is how to get it right. Um, so, wh wh um, so what are these elements about? Let's start um, here with, um, with creative alternatives. This is about what we can do. Uh, it's important in a quality decision to, uh, to think about alternative generation. Um, alternative, gener alternative generation is about finding appealing, creative, and feasible alternatives 
a decision is as good as, as the best alternative. If you don't have any, you don't have any decision. Uh, the next element is, is um, relevant and reliable information, or we sometimes say meaningful and reliable information. This is about what we know and talking about what is uncertain about the potential outcome, um, whether you will get in an, an accident or not driving drunk, for example. The next element is about clear values and, and trade-offs. What we truly want, we actually do want to get home safely, we want to get home in not too much time. Um, we call these elements collectively, these three elements collectively, the basis for our decisions. It's actually very simple. It's what we can do, what we know, and what we want. Now, there's more to it than this, right? There's, uh, of course, there's, there's some sound reasoning, some logically correct reasoning. We apply our, our sound reasoning to give us the most of what we want in the light of the uncertainty that we have. All of that will give us a rational decision. Now, the, there's also this question of having the appropriate frame. Framing is about solving the right problem. We've got to set the appropriate frame and, and solve that problem, uh, and solve that, that the right problem, um, because the opposite situation is extremely problematic. Having the perfect solution for the wrong problem doesn't help us. And then finally, we have commitment to action. Um, this actually is coming back to the definition of a decision. We have to get commitment to action in order to really have a decision and actually take that action. Um, getting your intentions right, but not your actions, does not lead to decision quality. We have to make sure we get to the simplicity of what should we do and actually do it. Now, why do we draw this as a chain? Um, a decision is no better than its weakest link, just like a chain. In other words, all elements are equally important. An organization with decision quality capability will be challenging the quality in each dimension of its decisions. For example, starting on frame, are we working on the right decisions? Is our perspective broad enough and insightful? Are we including everybody's perspective? On alternatives, have we explored the available space of things we could do? Do we have really distinct alternatives? Are they all very much the same? Are they attractable, genuinely doable? Have we missed any real opportunities? Uh, on information, have we overlooked critical factors or uncertainties? Um, do we use quality ranges of uncertainty if you're using a decision analytical approach? And then on the dimension of values, have we balanced the values of our key stakeholders? Have we heard all their positions? Have we assessed the trade-offs between them? And do we understand our risk appetite? And then on reasoning, have we, have we developed logically correct and transparent evaluations and approach to evaluation? Have we used a, a well-structured logical method to incorporate uncertainty? And now we're doing the math right. You could even say. Um, and then on commitment to action, have we involved all the key stakeholders in the decision from the beginning, building ownership, commitment along the way, having the people that are actually going to have to implement involved? Uh, now, how do we get to uh, decision quality? Quality. How do we achieve that? Um, for strategic decisions. We, uh, FEG developed the Dialogue Decision Process, or DDP, uh, which is for a collaboration between decision makers, the members of the decision board at the top here, and on the other hand, so subject matter experts and decision support staff. In, in, in the, those are the people in the project team. Um, again, for tackling strategic decisions, it in, what this does is it enables an efficient use of decision makers' time. The aim is to, to generate clarity of thought and decision quality about the decision before making it, as I said. Because of the magnitude and complexity of the problems that are being tackled when you're talking about strategic decisions, the process is, is divided into a number of steps, framing, alternative generation, evaluation, implementation. In each of these steps, the decision makers are signing off on the, on the frame, the alternatives to consider, 
the evaluation, the plan for implementation. With this structure, we ensure that we have the right frame, we don't waste people time, people's time, we don't create unnecessary iteration, and we're solving the right problem. We're considering uh, alternatives that are really worth investigating in, in detail because that investigation, that evaluation is so um, so much of an effort. Um, and so this evaluation is a big effort because it's often applying the right logic that includes probabilistic analysis, which is the, which is part of the decision analysis cycle. Now, I'm not going to go into that in detail. Right? There's a lot of time-tested analytical tools like a decision hierarchy, strategy table, decision trees. Um, are the, the participants in the EDPN network will know what uh, what I'm what I'm talking about here, and others as well. They provide insights to us, and they're only they should only really be used as needed. Always being um, decision focus. Many of you know this. Um, the question is, what do we really need to do when we're not looking at a strategic decision? Um, the time uh, and effort actually spent on decisions really depends on their nature. It all, and also very much on how many decisions your organization has to make within a given time frame. Um, if, you're, if we start from the bottom here, we look at the, the quick decisions that are frequent, sort of everyday choices, um, we use sort of predefined rules of thumb. And at the top, when we talk about the strategic decisions, these are things that take days, weeks, or months, and you need this rigor rigorous dialogue. Um, when it comes to, uh, to achieving and reaching decision quality. In between, though, um, are these significant decisions. They're important, but less demanding, and maybe not as strategic, um, and they require some effort, too, but not as much effort. They're, and, and our, they're, they're, things that, they're decisions that you should be making in hours or days. And our recommendation is not to bog down the organization, but to use decision quality, as we've defined it, as a checklist. We call this the DQ appraisal process. And, uh, an effective process for achieving decision quality in these non-strategic decisions start with defining a good frame and ends with commitment to action. Um, here, here we've drawn our DQ chain vertically. The same elements are here. Increasing the quality of the other elements besides the two that I just mentioned right now requires some iteration, but where? Attempting to tackle the elements in one sequen sequential pass is actually inefficient. It's not a good use of the organization's time. And, and in many ways, a formula for failure. Here's what, here's what you can do to be efficient. Um, first thing is assess where you are on each dim dimension of decision quality. Look what you've, what you've put together. I just uh, within your, your your first pass, uh, look at your decision, and we've just defined a scale here, sort of a, a slider scale. The 100% point is where additional work is not worth the effort. It doesn't change what you do. And looking at each, the thing is, then you look through the elements of decision quality. You conduct a quick once through to identify weak links. And then you dedicate a focused effort to strengthen those links that are weak before you commit to action. And here's an example where um, a leader thought she was ready for action. You can see that the triangle on the bottom, commitment to action, is very high. Um, and this was a significant but maybe more operational type of decision. She discussed the status with her team by um, this, this leader by, by simply going through the checklist of the elements of decision quality, 
And on reflection, it became clear that the amount of information that was being used, what they knew about the, the potential outcomes and some assumptions that they were making was actually pretty good. The team needed to, to be sent off to collect that information and do some research. And they moved the rating on the, on the bottom scale here, commitment to action, back a bit uh, until they were able to resolve that. That's not an elaborate dialogue decision process. It's focusing on, focusing on filling the gaps. And we actually regularly hear these kinds of stories um, from organizations, people in organizations that we've trained on how this simple checklist approach has, has made leaders much more effective and successful. Uh, this is actually a leadership instrument, I would call it. We're, so, um, what's the ideal approach between this DQ appraisal and the full PDP, uh, whether to use one or the other? Well, it depends on a number of, of factors, which I've started to allude to several times here. Um, one is magnitude of the problem being tackled, which can range from significant to strategic in terms of what is this at stake for the company. And I'll talk about that a little more in, in a bit. There's also organizational complexity. This ranges from having a single decision maker, uh, which can be very simple, to, to many different decision makers with different perspectives who may be in conflict that you have to take into account. If you're more on the left with a simple, clear one decision maker, then a DQ appraisal might be appropriate. Analytical complexity, your decision may be an easy one to solve with pencil and paper, or one that requires more rigor. Um, and then there's this question of likely, like, likelihood of decision traps. Um, if you're getting into unfamiliar territory, then the behavior of an organization can become problematic. It's like entering a new business. Um, you have a higher chance of falling into these traps a typical example is how an organization deals with uncertainty in a new space they don't know about. Can they live with the uncertainty or not? And, uh, and then there's the content challenge. The decision at hand may require a lot of depth um, in terms of scientific information, technical knowledge, um, about many different things, which may make it challenging. And um, if there's many different elements, then um, you're going to have to seek a more robust approach. Let's, I'm going to dive into each of these elements a little bit more to help uh, you all make a call on whether to be on the right or the left-hand side, more toward full PDP or more toward DQ appraisal. Um, let's, let's first talk about magnitude. Um, the concept of, of of, of magnitude is about very much about the financial consequence, the cost of failure, for example. And, and because of that, it's a relative one. It's a relative concept. One business may be more flexible, have, more, have greater um, financial ability to react to a negative situation. And, and the things that, uh, those decisions that would significantly impact that flexibility of a enterprise as a whole are the strategic decisions. Otherwise, you can actually try more. Um, in addition, in this graphic, and, and this varies by organization, a governance structure should be, be put in place to specify which decisions require which type of approach. And that also defines the appropriate set of responsibilities and decision and approval rights. Um, Note that this is a very simplified, uh, simplified illustrative example where the, um, the approval rights are at the highest, uh, are, the, are, are the highest at the highest level in the organization. Real organizations are actually more complex, and um, this whole subject of defining decision rights is a is a whole separate webinar. Um, but it's often the case that. Going hand in hand with these approval limits is also the necessity to go through a full DDP. And with many, many smaller decisions that are lower down in the organization, a DQ appraisal approach would be more appropriate. 
But depending on the nature of the decision in the other dimensions that I'm going to talk about, you may actually use the, DQ, uh, the DDP even at the lowest level of approvals. Um, let's see why this is the case by looking at those other dimensions. Um, so, yeah, this, um, the, diagnosing the decision goes beyond this magnitude, as, I'm sa as I said. Um, it's about this, also about organizational and analytical complexity. Um, what is organizational complexity or analytical complexity? What can make an organization organizationally complex? What can hinder decision making? That's what, what we need to talk about in a little bit more detail. Um, I have to show you a two by two matrix here. <laughs> Again, um, on the uh, horizontal axis, we have analytical complexity. Um, decisions, let's talk about that first. Decisions can be analytically complex for all kinds of reasons. There could be many, many interrelated uncertainties um, that are difficult to analyze on a back of an envelope. Um, many options, many alternatives, dynamics, downstream decisions, um, or you may have to take into account many decision, uh, many decision criteria um, and logically connect the <clears throat> different factors. Or there may be aspects of competitive gaming. What are the decisions of the competitors? Um, in the, in, the, in the extreme case, you'll be requiring decision analysis to do the evaluation before making the decision. Um, and and uh, I'm sure many EDPN uh, network participants will be uh, thinking of themselves in this uh, lower right-hand part of this picture uh, in terms of the approach that they, uh, they think is appropriate to use. Um, <clears throat> but there's the other extreme, and they're simple. Right, you can use some uh, some rules of thumb, and then uh, there's also this organizational complexity on the on the vertical axis here, and um, the, the situation can become organizationally complex because the problem will cut across uh, different functional lines. There may be partisan conflict, and there may be differences in their values and motivation. Um, just dealing with geographically dispersed teams. And um, and how then they have, as a consequence of that, very different frames of re reference, different personalities and competencies and degrees of power. It, you end up having to deal with the group dynamics uh, and you know just human nature in groups. And uh, typically, right, the facilitation is the solution to this. And uh, but the. the the question is, is what do you do if you have, you're high on both dimensions, organizationally complex and, and analytically complex? Here's where you, where you need this rigorous um, approach to DQ that um, is typically the case. If you, if you use only decision analysis, you get the right answer, but nobody cares because you haven't brought the organization on board. If you use only facilitation, uh, you get an alignment around nonsense. Um, and so when, in, in the high, high case, you're applying this rigorous decision approach that we call the dialogue decision process um, that we talked about it a minute, minute ago. But what if you're in the middle here? If, you're, if you have a decision that falls in the middle of this chart and you're, um, best, you're actually best off by trying to tailor this DQ process to your need, um, as we've been discussing. And we'll explain further on. And this is a matter of, of judgment, as I said before, of how organizationally complex and how analytically complex that is. And there are some, in between the appraisal and the full DDP, there's also some tailoring that we'll talk about in a little bit that you could cons consider. Before I do that, I'd like to talk about the decision traps. I alluded to that briefly. To make that more tangible, for um, the listeners, let's talk about some examples here. This is not an exhaustive list, but um, some things that you've probably seen. Endless debate in the organization. People saying, we need more information. The analysis is incomplete. That's the typical situation where you get to paralysis by analysis. Great excuses, but you're actually not making any progress. Or 
you delay, and maybe never take action. This feels, people saying, oh, this feels risky. I'm not sure if this is a good move for us. You end up being too late to succeed. You're not late to play the game. And this is where you miss opportunities. Uh, both of these situations are, are generated by not having uh, a language to deal with uncertainty. And so people get scared and pull back. There's another behavior, though, in not dealing well with the uncertainty, which is people say, well, that just feels right, and they jump in and hope. But um, jumping and landing can feel very different. Um, this is ignoring uncertainty. And then there's another typical behavior, which is advocacy. Um, somebody pushes through their desired solution. I know this industry, this is how it's done. It sounds very convincing, convincing, but it's probably wrong. It's in the wrong place, wrong time. Why? Because of missed opportunity. This is, the problem here uh, is that you're missing alternatives. And we tend to say, Let's, let's let the alternatives compete, and not the people in the organization that are trying to get their way. Um, the risk in all of these cases, in all these traps, is of losing substantial value. In, in the case that you do not have a sufficiently rigorous process, if you think you're going to fall into any of these traps, then structure the approach more carefully. If you've got a good eye out for these potential traps, then you can use the DQ appraisal process. Um, analytical, com analytical complexity um, and is one aspect, right? But um, and, and organizational complexity. But there's another aspect here, and 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 the decision traps. But there's another aspect aspect here, which is the content. And I'll say something about this briefly. And I think the what this means is pretty clear. Um, let me just call out that that you want to be rigorous in, in your approach if you're getting into a new business area that you do not understand well. Then you're going to have to make sure that you're digging for information to understand that space better. New business areas, for example. Now, what I'd like to do next is take a closer look at an example so we can see how this diagnosis of the decision situation that can help us find the right approach. See how the decision approach can be tailored as well. Um, we, we, we want to talk about this tailoring in terms of, of um, thinking about where to put the emphasis if you're going more toward a dialogue decision process. This example uh, is from um, the pharmaceutical industry. It's an example of um, the life cycle of a drug, actually, um, starting very early in preclinical development and going all the way through patent expiry. And I'm taking the perspective here of um, cash flow over time. That's what this uh, black curve is. When you start out in preclinical development, there's significant spending, but it really takes off in terms of hundreds of millions per year when you get into human testing, clinical development. Um, and that tends to continue until you get to market. There's a stage before you get to market, the next step, which is the uh, approval process, getting regulatory approval, and then you get into uh, a period of sales where you have large, hopefully very large, positive cash flow, and that ends uh, upon patent expiry. Sometimes folks go and become uh, over-the-counter products, and there's a transition at that time. The um, during over this whole cycle, different uncertainties are resolved. In this clinical phase, the efficacy and uh, safety is resolved. If you go to the next um, uh, pricing and access uncertainty is resolved when you're when you enter the market and as you start to build your sales, you can see the trajectory you're on. It's often pretty clear within the first six months to a year, and you have a good a good deal of the achievable market share is resolved. In the market, there's 
of course, there's new uncertainties. Remaining in exposure to drug safety issues and, and exposure to new drug entries. And you're going to have to react to that, right? These are the often reacting that is intuitive decision. It's an emergency reaction to the drug safety issue. You don't have time for an elaborate DDP process. Um, so let's think about the types of approaches at each stage. In preclinical, very early on, a DQ appraisal process can be right, right? This is you're thinking about which indications to con just even consider to explore. Once you're in clinical development where the big spending is, you can see the connection here to the magnitude problem. And here you also have many parts of the organization involved. Um, and you have complex uh, decisions in terms of the analytics. You need the full DDP. It's things like what indications, what applications for the non-farmer people um, to pursue. Um, what is the ideal launch order of these indications? What geographies to launch in? How to design the very expensive three trials? Um, the, in, once you're in the market, uh, you have choices around how to optimize your market penetration for your assets. These can be very operational in, in, in nature. A DQ appraisal could be very much more appropriate. Um, sometimes a tailored DDP with a spe spe special focus uh, could be appropriate. For example, if you're thinking about investing in new claims um, for, your, for your label, um, or you want to extend the patent window uh, by uh, in, in expanding your patent suite. Um, and then after uh, patent expiry, um, you, you can be making choices around um, continuing to sell, withdrawing the product, or uh, keeping manufacturing in-house or outsourcing. These are often less strategic unless other products are impacted. And, and a DQ appraisal, process can be very much appropriate here. Uh, what is a tailored DQ process, uh, a tailored DDP process? It's about the emphasis, um, emphasis on diagnosis or the assessment phase, framing or alternative generation. They can be different for each strategic decision and requiring more or less effort. For example, it's clear that in the pharmaceutical clinical development example that we were just looking at, alternative generation is a very important phase where a lot of effort has to be applied. Defining the product target profiles that could be achieved with each strategy also requires a very large amount of discussion and cross-functional agreement between commercial and development as well as the details of trial plans we're considering. Uh, that can take up most of the time of the decision support team and also the decision makers. In, um, in, a, pro in a project that we did in the semiconductors, uh, most of the time of the team and the decision makers were spent actually on evaluating the alternatives due to the number of alternatives that came out and also the extreme analytical complexity. Um, and then for an, an entirely different client in the consumer uh, market space um, where we developed a product strategy, most of the time was actually spent right up front on assessing the situation, really gathering an understanding of the market up front. And once that was clear, the rest of the process and the decision making was actually relatively easy. Um, another uh, aspect about tailoring the DDP to the situation has to do with the governance. Um, in large, complex organizations, sometimes you need uh, a two-stage uh, dialogue process. Um, here we've established two levels. Um, the aim is to overcome organizational silos on the one hand um, and um, focus discussions with the minimizing the unnecessary iterations um, because you often have an interim layer where um, department heads have to be able to provide their guidance and reactions and feedback. Uh, getting into designing the right dialogue um, could be a whole other webinar, and um, I think, uh, but we can't do that today. Um, what I'd like to do in, in wrapping up our session um, is talk about um, a couple of closing remarks here. 
uh, some closing notes. Um, we hope that the message has come across that the approach needs to be tailored, among other things, based on the time available. And therefore, we're uh, advocating becoming proactive um, to be able to deal with time. If the life cycle of a product or a business is, is generally, or the overall business is generally well understood, the organization can, should organize their, can and should organize their significant strategic decisions into what we call a decision agenda on um, ordering them in terms of um, priority, where higher preempts lower. What do you need to get done uh, more urgently? or with priority. Um, and then on the, the horizontal axis here, you need to, to think about how much time you actually have. Um, and, and, in, and that schedule right, should be driven by timeliness rather than trying to be hasty or having to be hasty, unnecessarily hasty later on. Um, a decision agenda could look like something like this. It contains workflows to be able to actually manage how decisions are made. Um, and actually, it's, it's managed actively where decisions can be moved around, up or down in this hierarchy along the way due to the new information that becomes available. In setting this up, the three questions you need to be asking yourself are, what decisions need to be to be made? What decisions should we make? What is the nature of those decisions? We talked about how to classify those. And what will it take to reach DQ in each decision? Where are my gaps? So again, we're going to experiment with the poll <laughs> to wrap up this session. It would be great to hear your thoughts. Where do you see a potential for improving decisions decisions in your organization. Again, please you know, use the buttons on the right-hand side of your screen to, to provide your answers. Um, I'll hand over to you again, uh, Rick, uh, um, so you can open the polls for input. Yeah, yeah. let it run a little longer this time. I'll, uh, I'll uh, don't touch anything uh, here on this side, so I'll let everybody uh, put in their answers. I'll look a little bit better on my dashboard here on who's actually uh, uh, putting in the answer, so I'll uh, keep it open. Uh, and then we also uh, received um, a question through the q and A. I um, I also um, invite others to uh, to ask questions. Uh, we have one that will uh, just I'll repeat that in, in a second, and we'll, we'll address that. Um, five more seconds to uh, to close the poll. Um, most of us have actually participated. Uh, one third has not participated yet. And um, let's do another five seconds because the statistics here are still moving. Okay, 70% is, um, is participating here. I'm gonna share the results. So what do we see? So what do we see? Um, we see that you guys feel, or the participants on the line feel, that um, there's actually a, 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 a pretty a high number of different reasons or uh, issues that you, you come up with in terms of uh, potential for improvement. Uh, one is about framing, uh, establishing the, the, the right value criteria. Um, Commitment to action actually stands out as the higher score here. Mm -hmm. So uh, rational decision making by itself is not the highest score, but it's getting to uh, to what should we do. Yeah, and uh, actually that's very much a symptom of the involvement of the people in the organization. And that actually may be a sign that a uh, in the types of decisions that people are involved in, a more rigorous approach may actually be important. At least an open discussion on decision quality is important. Um, and actually, that's a take-home message here um, on this last slide. 
Uh, we think it's key that decision makers, decision support staff, people participating in decision making processes should be able to judge when to use which approach. Uh, in, in the important decisions, you need to have the skill to demand EQ. And in the middle here, you need to have the skill to judge decision quality. So um, that's, the, that's the end of the presentation. Um, um, I, um, I just want to thank everybody um, for uh, listening. Um, we invite you to continue the conversation. We have a, a, few, a few questions to address directly right now. Um, could you read the question? Yeah, so uh, there's a question about uh, um, traps. And do you believe that there are specific traps that are more common or occur more routinely than others uh, in, uh, in specific uh, cultures? Um, I see here also risk appetite, organizational structure, personality. Um, I, I don't think it's uh, necessarily culturally specific, um, but I do think that the traps that most often occur, and that's the reason that we called them out, are traps associated with not having a language for dealing with uncertainty. And uh, without having the language and understanding um, what an organization is getting into by pursuing one path or another, um, organizations most often shy away from the uncertainty. Jumping in and hoping is probably less frequent. Um, and once organizations, I call it embracing uncertainty, once they embrace un uncertainty, in other words, start to put something down on paper, what, what are the positive and negative outcomes that they could imagine? What do they know? What do they think is the chances of them occurring? It's much, much easier for an organization to take action. I think that's in general in human nature. Is there another question? Um, no, there is not yet. So I invite everybody to, uh, to use the Q&A um, chat function here, basically. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give you uh, a couple of more seconds to, um, uh, to enter the questions, and uh, we'll try to answer them in the time left. Um, uh, uh, in addition, we're also, uh, we're also inviting you to continue the conversation after the webinar. Uh, you'll, you'll find our uh, contact information uh, here. And um, yeah, let's let's wrap up uh, with the final notes. And um, coming back to the to the closing remark uh, remarks, uh, we have uh, an EDPN conference in October in Copenhagen. Uh, it's uh, from October 4 to 6, and it will be held at the uh, Copenhagen Business School. Um, the conference is really built around a couple of teams uh, how can we address complexity, uh, for example, in your business environment? How can we keep clarity of thought in this world of overwhelming information? Uh, many emails, big data. Uh, what support do executives need for uh, truly effective and efficient decision making? And how do we probably, properly take risk and uncertainties into account when making investment or strategic decisions? Now, the, um, the agenda is uh, uh, preliminary, preliminary available online. I'll give you a link in a, in a minute. Uh, we have speakers from life science uh, uh, space, oil and gas, but also uh, technologies and uh, selected universities. Um, we are uh, having a, a very interactive conference uh, with a, a decision-making workshop uh, where, for example, you could uh, start to learn and apply the uh, DQ um, appraisal uh, process. We have actual and local decision owners uh, in, in the conference and we're going to work on decision making. In addition, we have a capability building uh, forum specifically around building decision making capability. We have a, a couple of folks from industry who have been to uh, transition to that capability in their organization. And of course, there will be some social networking events, <clears throat> excuse me, starting on October 4th. Um, the conference will be facilitated by uh, Professor Ryder Brussels. He is Professor of Petroleum Investment and Machine Analysis at the University of Stavanger and also at the Norwegian Institute of uh, Technology. 
Now, um, the registration is open on the link uh, here, and uh, there's an early bird rate available till the end of the month. I see that we rounded the month to the wrong number here. It's actually open till May 31, and it's 100 euro less than uh, the standard uh, price for the conference. Um, till the conference, we also have uh, a series of other webinars. We'll, we'll keep you up to date on that. And um, yeah, please join us in October in any case. And please register through the, um, uh, through the link here, uh, etouches.com slash edpm. Okay, um, with that, we're concluding on the webinar today. Thanks again for your participation. And uh, we hope to welcome you again in, in one of the uh, next webinars or at the conference in uh, Copenhagen. Thank you. Bye-bye.